Many people tell stories about wars, but peaceful life is just as fascinating and sometimes more devastating. Surely everyone has seen the terrifying costumes of plague doctors. Glass eyes, beaks, and long cloaks. The image of these guys is tightly associated with something grim and severe. But who are they really? Let's find out together. Today we are going to live a day in the life of a plague doctor and find out that they are really cute and have done a very good deed. Meet our guest, Harry Kane. It's 1650 and he lives in the beautiful city of Edinburgh. Harry's profession is the plague doctor. He lives on the outskirts of the city in a very rich house full of expensive trinkets. Kane gets free drinks at the local bar, and even the church is in no hurry to drag Harry to the bonfire despite his defiant appearance. Even though it was the 17th century for a second, this was still commonplace. The reason is simple. There's a plague raging across the continent, and Kane's job is to deal with the problem. And before we get into the details, let's take a look at the setting. The plague is a terrible disease with a mortality rate of almost 95%. At first, a person feels pain and inflammation in the lymph nodes, then the nodes enlarge and the patient becomes feverish. Over a period of 2 to 12 days, the infected person may also develop plague pneumonia and is very likely to die. Inflamed lymph nodes look specific and such a tumor is called a bubo. This is why the medieval plague is most often referred to as the bubonic plague in various sources. As you probably know, the surest way to contract the plague is through a rat bite, but there is another, in many ways, more deadly vector, fleas. They're small, they jump, and they bite people. Worst of all, they carry the plague just as well as humans. They can be infected both by contact with a person and by droplets in the air. Nowadays, plague is easily treated with antibiotics such as streptomycin or its analogs, but the first vaccine was not tested until 1934, so our ancestors had a hard time. Contrary to popular belief, the plague is not a medieval disease. It is mentioned in the Bible in the chapter describing the war between the Israelites and the Philistines. And the hand of the Lord was heavy upon the Azotians, and he destroyed them, and afflicted Azotus and the coasts thereof with emeralds says the Bible, which itself attributes the killing effect of the plague to God's punishment. But as we can see from the description, the growths are most likely buboes, and judging by the terrible death rate among the people, it is almost 100% plague. A little later, in our century, mass outbreaks of disease began to be called pandemics. The first pandemic was called Justinian's Plague and began in 551. Within 30 years, it claimed more than 100 million lives. That's almost a third of the civilized world's population. From then on, the plague returned at various intervals and took a terrible toll. In 1352, another pandemic killed 25 million Europeans, a third of the continent's population. For almost all of human history, the plague has walked side by side with people. Even after vaccines were invented, the disease killed more than 12 million people in India between the early 20th century and 1963. In Edinburgh in 1650, the whole rich heritage of Greek and Roman medicine was successfully reduced to zero by the church, which did not consider it to be a God-pleasing pursuit. When people fell ill, the first thing they did was call a priest because they thought doctors were crazy. Hence, the wild mortality figures that eventually plagued doctors like Harry. Prayer didn't work, and as much as people disliked the church, it was clear that something had to be done and in the face of hundreds of thousands of dead bodies, the medical profession made some progress. But the change was not radical. Treatment was, by and large, by the poke method. Someone cauterized the wounds, someone practiced bloodletting, and the more clever ones were covered with leeches. We'll talk about the details later, but for now, let's talk about Harry's costume. Not all plague doctors wore the characteristic cloaks and masks. They were generally invented in 1619 through the efforts of the French physician Charles de Lorme. For centuries before that, doctors wore whatever they could find. Our Harry is a good plague doctor, so he dressed accordingly. Kane has a helmet on his head, which is actually a prototype of a gas mask. It completely covers his head, and even his eyes are protected by glass eyepieces. 
The beak, which gives the costume its pizzazz, actually has a useful cargo. Strong-smelling herbs and other medicines were placed in the beak. Doctors worked not only with patients who did not smell particularly good, but sometimes even with corpses, where it was necessary not to faint from the smell. The part of the beak that came into contact with the nose was also covered with a sponge of incense, and the doctor chewed garlic all the time. Further along, we come to a cloak. Its main purpose is to protect the doctor's body. Harry, like all members of his profession, did not want to touch his patients. He wore gloves, long fishing boots, and a walking stick. The cane was used to examine patients, cauterize wounds, and, if necessary, fight off the most violent. Was the plague doctor's costume effective? In part, yes. After all, as we mentioned earlier, the plague is actually spread by contact, so covering up makes a lot of sense. Also, Harry smears the clothes with grease and wax, which is ingenious in itself. The main carriers of the disease are fleas, and they can't bite through such clothing. But garlic is completely unnecessary and will not save you from the plague, nor will the beak. After all, as we have already mentioned, pneumonic plague is easily transmitted through the air, which is why the mortality rate among plague doctors was high. What does a plague doctor's day involve? Foremost, there are several types. The first can be called scavenging. One of Harry's most common jobs is to remove and bury corpses, and religions and rituals deeply religious nobles forgot, and often local lords from Edinburgh called doctors to remove the dead and dump them somewhere in the canal. Meanwhile, Harry could take whatever he wanted from their homes. Greed proved weaker than survival instinct, and few people ventured into the homes of the dead. As a result, the plague doctors could not only remove corpses, but also take whatever they wanted. That's why we mentioned a nice house and a bunch of old Kane's knickknacks at the beginning. Smuggling bodies was just part of his job. But there were doctors who did just that. We'll call them scavengers and move on to another category. The second category of doctors, to which our Harry belongs, are the orderlies. These guys really tried to help, but found themselves in a harsh reality when medicine had not developed for 500 years. These doctors were busy removing corpses, but at the same time, they were trying to take in patients. The most common method of treatment is to open an inflamed lymph node with a specific scalpel and then cauterize it. The problem is that there are a lot of inflamed nodes, and the operation is very painful. Moreover, it is enough not to cauterize even one millimeter of the infected surface, and the result will be in vain. But Harry Kane's career has also seen its share of successful treatments. It is true that they were also shattered by the harsh reality. It was believed that if a person was cured, God had helped them. But if someone died, the doctor was blamed. Of course, the death rate exceeded the number of people cured, so our Harry lives on the fringes and is considered a pariah. However, out of respect for his profession, he is still given free drinks, which can lead to a drunken brawl with one of the disgruntled relatives of the deceased. What can one say when, until the 19th century, astrology was considered a real science and much more prestigious than medicine? In addition, some of the orderlies resorted to extravagant methods of treatment. Some fed spiders to the sick, believing that they absorbed evil. Others made them sniff horse droppings to kill the plague with the stench. The more clever used jars, frogs, and leeches. But the third and smallest category of plague doctors were the seers. These were highly educated people who tried to use their genius to solve the problem. The learned doctor was, for example, the famous Nostradamus. Predicting the future was his hobby, and indeed, Michel de Nostradamus was a gifted physician. For his contribution to the plague, the parliament of one region of France even gave Nostradamus a pension for life. There were others, like the surgeon de Chaliac, who, after discovering he had the plague, isolated himself from society and spent a whole week systematically cutting and squeezing out plague growths and later cauterizing them. It worked, and de Chaliac tried to put the knowledge into widespread practice. Unfortunately, it did not work very well. The murder of the Roman heritage and the cult of the church were not the only reasons. There was total unsanitation, where not washing for a couple of months was commonplace, and dirt, as everyone knows, is a flea's best friend. Plague doctors were one of the straws the powerful clung to in order to save their asses. They weren't exactly loved, but every town needed them. That's why Harry Kane had a contract with the local mayor. 
The lad's monthly salary was a staggering 110 pounds. That's the equivalent of six and a half tons of beef, or 220 pounds a day. The average carpenter earned Harry's monthly wage for two years. By comparison, a year's rent for a luxury apartment on the city's high street was around 50 pounds. Even the lowest cast of plague doctors had no money problems. None at all. The only problem was surviving. Science still can't really answer the question of why, with such unsanitary conditions and a lack of medicine, the plague didn't wipe out the entire planet. The most popular version is the production of immunity, similar to vaccines, of course. It is likely that some people actually caught the weakened version of the plague and rebuilt their organisms. Maybe the plague does have a reproductive limit, or perhaps the plague doctors did their part disposing of the corpses and maintaining at least some semblance of sanitation. So, our old Harry was doing a good, albeit dirty, job at great risk to his life. His treatment may have been the reason some of our ancestors survived. Make Harry happy by liking this video, because that's all we have to say. See you soon, friends.